Good morning, and welcome to Oil Corporation's second quarter 2023 earnings conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal your conference specialist for pressing the star key followed by zero. Following today's brief opening comments, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star, then one, on your touchstone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. Please note, this event is being recorded. I now will turn the conference over to Steve Keenan, Owens Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, Steve. Thank you, Keith. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, let me remind you that this discussion, along with the associated slides and the question and answer session that follows, will include statements regarding estimates or expectations of future performance. Please note these are forward-looking statements and that actual results could differ materially from those projected. Some of the factors that could cause actual results to differ from our projections are described without limitations in the risk factors section of our most recent Form 10-K and in yesterday's second quarter earnings press release. A copy of today's transcript and slides will be available in our website under the Investors section under Past Events. Our earnings press release and other financial data and information are available under Press Releases. With me this morning are Scott Sutton, Olin CEO, and Todd Slater, Olin CFO. I'll now turn the call over to Scott Sutton to make some brief remarks, after which we'll be happy to take your questions. Thanks, Steve, and good morning, everybody. Um, global market conditions continue to be quite poor. Additionally, our performance in the second quarter was not up to expectations, partially due to the previously announced Freeport vinyl chloride monomer plant operating issues, but also due to excessive Asian epoxy resin exports and our associated epoxy asset right sizing activities. These factors will result in a lower trough expectation for 2023 adjusted dividend. The bright spot in the second quarter was our purchase of 2.5% of our outstanding shares while simultaneously reducing net debt compared to the first quarter. Since January 1st, 2022, we have purchased 21% of our outstanding shares. In the third quarter, we expect epoxy resins and system sales volumes to slightly improve relative to the second quarter. However, inventory reduction efforts will leave the business in negative EBITDA territory. While Winchester's performance is expected to slightly improve in the third quarter, mainly due to international and domestic military growth, our chloralkali and vinyls business is expected to be slightly down, mainly due to execution of our leadership model as we see bottoming of ECU values in some geographies, likely a positive sign for 2024. This is our time to be tested, and I am confident that the Olin team is up to that test. It should be clear from slide number four that Olin believes running a value strategy with lots of built-in free options delivers more total cash for shareholders versus any alternative strategy. Looking forward, we are working on numerous initiatives to make sure both future peaks and troughs from that value strategy are higher than our previous results. Those initiatives are spelled out on slide number five. Keith, that concludes my opening remarks, and we can now proceed to questions. Yes, thank you. At this time, we will begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your touchstone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble the roster. And this, uh, morning, this morning's first question comes from Hassan Ahmed with Alembic Capital. Morning, Scott and Todd. Um, you know, question, uh, well, two-part question. One on uh, the implied sort of uh, trough earnings number uh, and the other one on sort of the peak number that you put up on your presentation. Um, so first on the, 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 the trough number, I mean, if I take a look at your implied 
Q4 2023 guidance, it's around 300 million, right? And I annualized that. That's obviously 1.2 billion. And obviously, you guys, um, you know, talked about the VCM, Freeport, Texas facility being sort of one of the cause agents, epoxy being, you know, call it below trough being another cause agent of uh, this sort of perceived below trough guidance. So is the delta between the 1.5 billion to 2 billion sort of trough range that you gave versus the annualized 300 million Q4 2023 guidance that you gave uh, primarily because of the VCM side of things and the epoxy side of things? Yeah, thanks, Hassan. Yeah, look, I mean, first of all, I, I would say that 2024 has a lot more positives than negatives, and we're calling a trough at $1.4 billion, not $1.2 billion. Now, the, the difference between $1.4 billion and, you know, what we've called out is our, our previous uh, trough there, yeah, I mean, we've got a $100 million problem with VCM, but, you know, on top of that, it really is the mass of material that's come out of Asia in epoxy. And, you know, you heard me say that we're going to run one quarter probably here at negative, negative EBITDA territory. I mean, Hassan, I would also add that we have had to run our model a little bit deeper. I mean, you know, demand declines so fast relative to supply that if you look at rates, we're way below 50 percent in epoxy and we're not all that far are above 50%, you know, across our CAPV portfolio right now. So it's those things that make up the difference. Understood. And, and, and you know, uh, sorry, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the, the peak side of it I also wanted to sort of touch base on. Uh, you guys sort of flagged over $3 billion in the next peak, right? And if I take a look at what you guys on a quarterly basis were run rating in Q1-22 and Q2-22, it was over $850 million. And clearly, utilization rates weren't as tight as they potentially could be uh, in the next peak. Right, and you hadn't sort of restructured uh, the epoxy business as you are right now, right? So, I mean, from the sounds of it, three billion in the next peak actually sounds pretty bare bone. Is that fair? I mean, yeah, I mean, Hassan, look, our, our our outlook certainly says that the structure of core alkali only gets better over over time. And it's true that we've done some restructuring in our in our epoxy business, but I will say that in order for epoxy to get back to the levels it was, that that's probably a couple years out. So, you know, you're gonna see the, the next peak in chloralkali while epoxy is is still recovering, and that's why we put the next peak at somewhere just about three billion. Understood. And one last one, if I may, um, on Dow's earnings call, they basically uh, talked about how their contract with you was renewed through 2035. Um, you know, is there any sort of commentary you can give about, I know historically sort of Olin's talked about not really making any money on that contract, but is there any commentary you guys can give us uh, about that renewed contract? Yeah, I would just agree that we did reach um, a agreement, and I think that's going to be good for everybody in the future. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Okay. Sure. Thank you. And the next question comes from Steve Bone with Bank of America. Hi, right, thank you. Just continuing on to this, this peak EBITDA uh, discussion, is it more driven by chloralkali, and is your view on epoxy – a little more measured than it used to be, and with the former chloralkali, and are you are you moving any further down the path of of uh, partnering on some downstream polymer capacity, or is it a little too early for that? Well, I, I would say, I mean, the big driver of it is certainly chloralkali. There's no doubt epoxy will improve, but the structure of the epoxy industry, when you have a China that's probably added almost 20 percent, uh, you know, to the world's supply capability in the last 18 months or so, it's going to take a little more time. 
to, to recover. I mean, I'd also call out our Winchester business as well. I mean, that business has great fundamentals, particularly in the growth of international and domestic um, ammunition. So it's those things that will get us there. And one follow-up for you, Scott, on Winchester is what is going on competitively that's leading to a challenging you know, domestic commercial market? Is, is, the, is it underlying demand or is it, um, you know, increased imported product or competitive uh, lack of discipline? What, what would you attribute it to? Yeah. Well, I, I would say just a reminder, you know, even though it's challenging, it's certainly well above pre-COVID levels still. But but what is driving the challenge is, is I would say, across, you know, um, outdoor sports. Inventory is just generally increasing. That's not just a comment only on ammunition, but we're subject to that. And that's why it's a bit challenging. So there's destocking going on. Is that the issue? Well, it, 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 the, the, it's not necessarily, you know, destocking. I would say that look, inventory in the channel has creeped up, and therefore supply into the channel is slowing down. Right? There, there, there may be some follow-on destocking that that naturally would follow that, but that's the situation. And, and is some of that creep from Russian imports that you've talked about in the past? No, no. Russian imports have ended. If anything, imports into this country in terms of ammunition have gone down over the last 12 months, primarily to Russia importing zero anymore. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And the next question comes from Mike Sisson with Wells Fargo. Hey guys, um, look, I wanted to understand the 300 million a little bit. So, in, in the third quarter, uh, what's the impact from from the plant outages? Is it similar to the 80 million in, in in the second quarter, and then for the fourth quarter, 300 million? Um, fourth quarter, 300 million. Is it? Is there any impact from that extended into the fourth? Yeah, and let, let, let me clarify, Mike, the, the $80 million, first of all, because in our earnings release, that is a year-over-year -year quarterly comparison. It includes the planned cost of the turnaround that we were going to have. The guidance that we gave, or the early guidance we gave in the second quarter said, look, we have a $50 million impact, and that was versus the expectation. I would say when you're looking at the third quarter, it's very probable that that impact is the same. So what you have versus our earlier expectation is $100 million essentially spread evenly over the second and third quarter. Okay. Got it. And the fourth quarter doesn't have an impact. That's just kind of the run rate for where the ECU and everything's at, right? Yeah, I mean that that that's that's pretty much right, right? We've called out 1.4 million. You kind of back into the numbers you're using for the for the fourth quarter. You know, there's some natural slowdown in in some of the businesses, and there's still negative momentum in costing. Okay, and and then just in terms of where your mid cycle EBITDA could could be, is, is it sort of the the delta between the peak and this year, or is it a different number, and, and how long do you think it takes to sort of get to sort of a mid-cycle number? Yeah. Well, I, I would just say, Mike, that we, we expect 2024 to be, to be better. You know, there's good signs to that, I think, even though they are slowly maturing signs, and 2025 looks even better than that. So it's in that range. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And the next question comes from Evan McCarthy, Vertical Research Partners. Yes, good morning. Um, Scott, with regard to Caustic Soda, how much was your average price down in 2Q versus 1Q? Um, in chlorine, it seems like you had a quite divergent experience versus you know, consulting uh, marks, so to speak. I'm curious uh, as to any color you can provide in, in caustic as to where your own experience is 
perhaps differing or similar to, you know, outsiders' views. Yeah, yeah, and 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 so I, I won't give a specific number on that. Uh, you know, our caustic was definitely down in second quarter versus first quarter, and you know we're saying it's going to go down in third. It's not that far off from what you see in the trade publications. Perhaps a little bit favorable to that. Of course. You know, we had, just like you said, a different experience in merchant chlorine. You know, trade trade publications say flat to down. You know, we were able to lift merchant chlorine pricing in second quarter relative to first quarter, and we'll lift merchant chlorine pricing in third quarter relative to second quarter as well. Okay. Then, uh, secondly, um a financial question for you. If I look at your balance sheet, Olin's inventory levels in the second quarter were up 14% year over year in dollar terms. And my question is, you know, how how would you characterize your inventory in unit terms or or tons? Are are there product lines where you feel you have too much inventory and you need to draw it down or product lines where it might even be relatively lean? Uh, how, how would you characterize that? Hey, hey, Kevin, this is Todd, and thanks for the question. Yes, you know, through the first half of the year, you have seen a couple hundred million dollar working capital bill from Olin. Ultimately, as you see in our cash flow forecast for the year, we think working capital will actually be favorable. So you should expect to see working capital decline and turn into a source of cash in the back half of the year. Also, I think during uh, Scott's prepared comments, he commented about the expectation of reducing epoxy inventory during the third quarter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And the next question comes from uh, Mike Lathead with Barclays. Great. Thanks. Good morning, guys. First morning. question on morning. First question on epoxy. When you look at Asian exports and the prices they're selling for in the market, is your sense that producers there are below cash break even levels? And if so, how, if at all, does that change your thinking about how Olin should approach, say, the epoxy value chain? Yeah, thanks for the question. I would just say yes. I mean, you got to re- remember in China that they they've been, you know, operating with the favorability of negative chlorine values, right? At potentially negative hydrochloric acid values. So those key inputs, which is just one input, has gone into the epoxy chain with somebody paying the producers of epoxy to take it. That's totally different than, you know, any other geography, and it has, you know, nothing to do with covering any kind of level of fixed cost and certainly no return on capital. So, yeah, I think that's a real issue. We're going to consider um, you know, what we're going to do about proposing and duties in certain geographies as well, because this really can't go on. Fair, fair enough. And then second, just when you look at your chemicals volumes overall, with the exception of the VCM impact, do you think the second quarter is the low point in your volumes, or do you expect them to be stable or, or maybe lower in the back half? Yeah. I would say that for, for Olin, look, our, our volume challenge is effectively finishing here, right? We, we've taken it down enough to preserve values, run a leadership model where we're prepared to capitalize on the run out. So we've taken volumes down further enough to achieve that objective. Even in our epoxy business in the third quarter, we do expect systems and resin volumes to grow some. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And the next question comes from Jess Sikowskis with J.P. Morgan. Uh, thanks very much. Um, you've always spoken of the negotiation of the Dow contract as a meaningful future benefit in 2025. It, now, it seems that Dow is going to take 
um, less chlorine and caustic because of what they're doing in propylene oxide. Um, is it still a, a meaningful jump for uh, Olin in 2025, or, or is that no longer the case? Yeah, I, I would say it, it, it's really a positive arrangement for Olin. And Jeff, I mean, you're 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 right that you know one PO unit, you know, Dow has announced that they're closing that, so that volume goes away. But other volumes at that same site remain, and the site in Louisiana becomes the site of focus for the bigger volumes. So, so we shouldn't expect some meaningful contractual, some meaningful EBITDA benefit to you in 2025 because of the renegotiation of the contract. Is that correct? No, I, I think it's positive, Jeff. Okay. Um, in terms of your chlorine prices, are your um, th there's always a uh, there are always contract resets that. Olin benefits from because pricing in the old days was so poor. Um, is the is the positive momentum in prices in chlorine a function of the repricing of very old contracts, or is it more um, you know an accurate picture of the current market today? Well, I, I think a large part of the continual improvement in our average merchant chlorine pricing has to do with, you know, contracts um, maturing, maturing and being renegotiated. That's not the only part of it. You know, the part that's on spot, you know, we still continue to do well there. But the bigger part is the new co contractual arrangements where we exit these remaining legacy deals. Is there much more to go, or are you now pretty pretty much caught up? Well, we have a little bit more to go. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. And the next question comes from Duffy Fisher with Goldman Sachs. Yes, good morning. Scott, I was hoping, can you just kind of summarize all the changes you've made to your epoxy footprint, and what does that do you know, to the upside coming out? I mean, how much capacity have we taken off, you know, when we get through this downturn? How much different is your footprint today? Yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've made and are in the process of making quite a number of, of changes. You know, uh, uh, upstream, I'll say that, you know, we, we exited a cumene plant. We exited one of our BPA facilities. In the, in the resin area, we reduced our capability both in Freeport, Texas, and in Stata. And then at a, at a, a few downstream plants, we reduced our capability in, in solids, epoxy resin, and then we shut down a facility in Korea. So, yeah, I mean, that, that has reduced our our, our, you know, capability some. What I, what I will say is that in epoxy, you know, we, we had at least two of everything to begin with and sometimes three or four of everything. So we've gotten rid of that overhang. We're much more efficient now, and it's not going to take a massive amount of volume to put us closer to a higher capacity utilization. We're still working to get those costs out. Fair enough. And then you often talk about managing one side or the other of the ECU. As you look out over the next year or so, which side do you think you're going to have to work hardest on to manage? Uh, well, we, we work both sides, of, of course. But I will say that, that, you know, right now you see the, you know, rate of change of caustic pricing, and so we're just not participating in that market as much. In other words, we're setting our whole participation according to that dynamic, and doing that, of course, slows that rate of decline, and on the other side of the ECU, it certainly enhances where it's already a little bit tighter. So that's our positioning now. We'll stay in that positioning for a little while. I expect it to change. Maybe it'll change twice over the next year. Great. Thank you, guys. Yep. Thank you. 
And the next question comes from Rumor Swanathan of RBC Capital Markets. Hey, thanks for taking my question. Um, I had a question um, about the uh, PCI and your parlay volume. So your parlay volumes looks like they hit a um, high point in the second quarter um, as a percent of your sales, um, and yet you're still able to maintain the PCI in the two, you know, high 250s. So <clears throat> is that really um, the, the, the swing um, wheel you have, the flywheel you have to uh, maintain that PCI is the parlay volumes? And so when the market comes back and your utilization rates go higher in volume, um, you can service more of that volume from your own production, or how should we think about um, how the parlay volumes would would evolve um, in order to keep the PCI constant and and uh, maybe as your as your profitability improves? Well, I, I would maybe start with let me, let me redefine a little bit. You know what these parlay volumes are. So, you know when when we're faced with weak market conditions, we may very well reduce our production as we have. It doesn't mean that we back out of the market according to that same production volume decrease. We go out into the market and buy volumes out of the market to satisfy that demand that we have. And when I said earlier we've been having to run the model deeper, this is evidence that we're having to run the market, I mean run the model you know, a lot deeper and go out and buy more volumes. Part of this volume, right, is, is working through our Blue Water Alliance joint venture, which is set up to go out and manage global liquidity a as well. So all of those activities are just one contributing factor to keeping our profit contribution index up over time. And then if I could uh, just ask a follow-up. So on the uh, potential peak EBITDA of $3 billion, um, maybe if you annualize that, it would be somewhere in the range of uh, 700 or so for, um, for Q1 and Q4 and maybe, you know, eight to 900 for, Q for Q2, Q3. Um, could you potentially break down that um, by segment, um, and, you know, especially given some of the changes you've made on the footprint for Epoxy and, and CAV, um, what are those potentially contributing per quarter now under the new structure? Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I would say if epoxy's not going to be the contributor that, you know, it, it, it was in recent history where we were running, you know, $700 million plus annual EBITDA. Included in that $3 billion is not epoxy at that level. It's somewhere between today and that level. So what is in there is, you know, a, a strong performance from for alkali as, you know, the outlook on structure looks good. Demand outpaces supply. It's very likely that, in fact, caustic growth may outpace chlorine growth, you know, due to all the things that are going on with minerals and batteries and, and, and everything else, and that imbalance helps us in the future. So in the chemical side, it's much more heavily weighted toward chloralkali, and in the wind, in Winchester is a contributor to that as well. And in fact, for the first time ever, as evidence that we're going to move that way, for the first time ever in Q3, the consumer piece of the Winchester business is going to be less than 50% of that business. And the military plus other is the larger part of it. And, and just so I'm clear, you said there's a lot of drivers for 24, 25. So do you expect to maybe get closer to that peak by 25, 26? Or what's the timing on that? Thanks. Well, I, you know, I don't have a, a, a specific time, but, you know, it, it, it's going to take a couple of years. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. And the next question comes from Vincent Andrews with Morgan Stanley. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, just continuing on the, the sort of peak cycle definition, um, you know, just thinking back to the last peak, you know, obviously very unique period of time where you had uh, lots of supply outages and uh, supply chain issues and, and obviously very strong 
demand and, and significant stocking that's obviously reversing now. I, I assume, Scott, you're, you're looking for in the next peak cycle sort of a more traditional peak cycle where it's just tight utilization rates from, from supply and demand. But, you know, is that the case or are you sort of also assuming there'll be some exotica, um, you know, on the operational side? And then where would your operating rates be um, in, in, in that scenario? Would you actually be running full out or would you still be managing uh, the situation volumetrically in order to achieve that level of EBITDA? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, thanks for the thanks for the question. Look, I, I would say that okay, it, it's a bit more, you know, tr- traditional there as you know, global demand again outpaces global supply. I would say a situation like we had, you know, coming out of COVID, that kind of volatility where demand is overstimulated for whatever the the case is certainly on top of you know what we're showing as as our our peak cycle right now i I don't think that um we should expect that everything will be smooth right i mean traditionally these supply chains have faced you know all kind of challenges and volatility but you really haven't seen that over the last 18 months at least not in a way that you know impacted supply demand as demand climbs back as some mass comes out of the trade flows that's being injected into the trade flows today by Asia driven by China as that changes you'll start to see some of those problems with the supply chain likely exposed again Okay. And if I could just ask on the, the reduction in the cash flow, obviously commensurate with the uh, reduction in EBITDA, but in terms of use of that, that cash flow, I, I assume nothing's changing. Uh, we should assume a similar pace of share repurchases in the back half. Yeah, uh, good question. You know, we you know, leverage free cash flow as we look forward. We continue to see the first best use of leverage free cash flow as they continue to repurchase shares. Um, and, and that's what you should see us continue to do. Okay. Thanks very much, guys. Sure. Thank you. And the next question comes from Alexi Yefremov with uh, Key Bank Capital Markets. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, VCM outage. It, it, is it, it, it's somewhat meaningful in terms of U.S. cost of soda supply, I believe. Are you seeing any improvement in, in cost of supply and demand, uh, you know, since the outage? And, and as a follow-up to this question, is your goal for this outage to be over by the fourth quarter? Should, should we assume that at this point? Yeah. Hey, Alexi, I mean, this this outage is really an impact to 2Q and 3Q. And, you know, we haven't factored in any outage issue in the fourth quarter, nor do do we anticipate that. Okay. And so to, to some extent, this has impacted our upstream production. You know, this isn't the only way that we liberate finals intermediates, which in turn liberates caustic. But I would say that's really not a driver on U.S. caustic. What is the driver is going back to that that mass of flows that's come out of Asia and that has impacted you know global global trade flows and tends to back things up in the U.S. Gulf Coast. That's been more the driver of how caustic pricing has changed. Thanks, Scott. And uh, coming back to your configuration, uh, you know, with Dow, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, Dow will shut some PO capacity at Freeport that will free up some of your chloralkali capacity. Sh- should we assume that that's not used in any way, or, or, or is it more likely that you'll you'll look for, you know, some other derivative opportunities either? through joint ventures, other arrangements, or, or even organic investments downstream of Chloropoly? Well, I would just say it opens up possibilities, right? And, and those are sort of some of the free options that, that we have going forward, and we haven't made a decision about that. Got it. Thanks a lot. Sure. Thank you. 
The next question comes from Matthew Blair with uh, TPH. Hey, good morning, Scott and Todd. Uh, circling back to the Dow contract, Scott, you mentioned it was a, a positive resolution there. Uh, should we think about this as being more significant on the free cash flow side for you than the EBITDA side, or can you give us any color on, on that? Well, I, I would say it, it, it's probably favorable for both parties on both sides because there's some real win-win elements of this, and that not only helps, you know, how we're both running our day-to-day -day operations, but it also, you know, prevents um, inefficient investments on both parties' side, which drives free cash flow. So I would just say it's it's a positive for both parties on both those fronts. Sounds good. And then do you have any more uh, commentary on the epoxy side? Um, in terms of demand, could you talk about how things are, are going in areas like electronics and wind and, and autos? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, d d demand in in all of those areas, as, well, at least in, you know, electronics was certainly sluggish. Automotive coatings, at least in the U.S., has shown some recent recovery, and you've seen some of that in the coatings companies, you know, earnings announcement here. You know, there's a nice portfolio of of wind projects, and that's one of the biggest outlets for, you know, our systems activities. But, you know, those projects go through stops and starts, and there's been some level of inventory adjustment in those supply chains. But I would say all three of those areas, as we move into 2024, are positive. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And the next question comes from Frank Mitch with uh, Fermium Research. Hey, good morning. If I could just uh, point a clarification: the new terms uh, on the Dow on the Dow contract do they take place uh, when the old one was supposed to expire in October of 2025, or is there a different effective date for the new terms? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's roughly right. I mean, Frank, I won't comment on all the different dates and all the different improvements, but, you know, I guess you can average it there. All right, awesome. Thank you. And, yeah, I I, uh, I fully appreciate the difficulties uh, in the epoxy business, and obviously you've been taking a uh, number of steps uh, uh, to improve your own footprint. You, uh, you've outlined some of them, and I know in the past you, you've indicated that some of these actions – should start to lead to uh, 50 million annual EBITDA improvements starting in the fourth quarter. Given the degradation in the broader markets, how should we think about, you know, sort of these actions uh, that Olin is proactively taking will start impacting your uh, your income statement? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, principally, you'll see it more in 2024. It's actually being effective today and into the fourth quarter, Frank, but we're having to, to clean up our inventory on the balance sheet a bit, and, you know, that 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 is offsetting some of that underlying improvement that will expose itself after a couple quarters here. Gotcha. Th thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. And the next question comes from Josh Spector with UBS. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm just curious on EDC, and has your participation rate in that market changed at all? I mean, I think it was pretty minimal before. I guess with the VCM outage, has that pushed more material into there or, or not? And when do you think about when you would get more involved in that market in the future? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, thanks for the question. I, I wouldn't say it's changed that much, but, I mean, look, our participation in, you know, the global EDC merchant market, you know, we, we've traditionally been the biggest player there. But, you know, recently, because of low values, we had reduced that. I think through this period when we're having, you know, challenges in our VCM operation, still our participation hasn't changed all, all that much. I think that the interesting thing about, you know, PBC is 
U.S. inventories have declined, and you've seen the PVC players, you know, all nominate recent price increases. So eventually, the non-integrated PVC players, where our EDC ends up, are going to get back in business. We've just got to make sure we get the right product values when that phenomenon happens. Thanks. I appreciate that. And I guess when you talk about some of the win-wins potentially with Dow, do we be contemplating any increase in the amount of ethylene you can get from them? And I guess what's your desire for you to participate larger in whether EDC or, or VCM without a partner? Well, I, I would say, you know, our ethylene arrangements are, are kind of good forever. It's not forever. I forget how many years is left, but, you know, it was a, it was a long-term agreement for more than 20, 20 years, right? So, you know, we're set there. Um, we do have the ability, when it, when it makes sense, to partner with a vinyls player because, again, we, we, we have incremental capability there. We have, you know, the ECUs, the ethylene, the EDC capability, some level of VCM capability already. So, you know, we sit on a little gold mine there. The timing's just not right. Understood. Thanks, Scott. Yep. Thank you. And the next question comes to John Roberts with Credit Suisse. And just to confirm, nothing got renegotiated on the ethylene contract? Uh, we That was a contract that we had in place some time ago, and it wasn't part of the discussion. And then are, is any of the parlay activity in epoxies, or is it all in chloralkali vitals? Well, the majority of it is, is in chloralkali. Um, we've been successful at running that parlay strategy in epoxy until capacity utilization got so low, and so we've reduced that participation there. It just doesn't make sense to, to do it at the moment. Do you have any longer-term targets for both total parlay and the balance between epoxy and chloralkali? Well, I, I wouldn't say there's a, a target for a balance between, you know, chloralkali and epoxy. I would say that we're going to do the right amount of parlays so that we can keep a leadership strategy in place and keep our product values up even when our capacity utilization is low. So when our capacity utilization is very low, like it is now, you're going to see big percentages. When it goes up, you might see some smaller percentages. However, I will say that, you know, Blue Water is out there trading more caustic and more EDC across the oceans, and that trading activity will continue and grow no matter what our capacity utilization is. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And this concludes our question and answer session. And I would like to turn the floor to Scott Sutton for any closing comments. Yes. Well, I would just say thanks a lot to, to everybody for, for joining. So I think, Keith, that closes the call. Okay. Thank you. And as mentioned, the conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. And we now just connect your lines.